Hello everyone, today we read and comment the fourth chapter of the second book of von Clausewitz von Krieg. The text follows. Method will therefore be more generally used to become the more indispensable the farther down the scale of rank the position of the active agent. And on the other hand, its use will diminish upwards until in the highest position it quite disappears. For this reason, it is more in its place in tactics than in strategy. War, in its highest, highest aspects, consists not on a, of an infinite number of little events, the diversities in which compensate each other, and which therefore be a better or worse method, or better or worse governed, but of separate great decisive events which must be dealt with separately. It is not like a field of stalks, which, without any regard to the particular form of each stalk, will be moved, uh, moved better or worse, according as the moving instrument is good or bad, but rather as a group of large trees to which the axe must be laid with judgment according to the particular form and inclination of each separate trunk. How high up in military activity the admissibility of method in action reaches naturally determines in itself not according to actual rank, but according to things, and it affects the highest position in a less degree only because these positions have the most comprehensive subjects of activity. A constant order of battle, a constant formation of advance guards and outposts, are methods by which a general ties not only his subordinate's hands, but also his own in certain cases. Certainly, they may have been devised by himself, and may be applied by him according to circumstances, but they may also be a subject of theory, in so far as they are based on the general properties of troops and weapons. On the other hand, any method by which definite plans for wars or campaigns are to be given out, already made as if from a machine, are absolutely worthless. As long as there exists no theory which can be sustained, that is, no enlightened treatise on the conduct of war, method in action cannot but encroach beyond its proper limits in high places, for men employed in these spheres of activity have not always had the opportunity of educating themselves through study and through contact with the higher interests. In the impracticable and inconsistent disquisitions of theorists and critics, they cannot find their way, their sound common sense rejects them, and as they bring with them no knowledge but that derived from experience, therefore in those cases which admit of and require a free individual treatment, they readily make use of the means which experience gives them, that is, an imitation of the particular methods practiced by great generals, by which a method of action then arises of itself. If we see Frederick the Great's generals always making their appearance in the so-called oblique order of battle, the generals of the French Revolution always using turning movements with a long extended line of battle, and Bonaparte's lieutenants rushing to the attack with the bloody energy of concentrated masses, and we recognize in the recurrence of the mode of proceeding evidently an adopted method, and see therefore that method of action can reach up to regions bordering on the highest. Should an, impro uh, an improved theory facilitate the study of the conduct of war, form the mind and judgment of men who are rising to the highest commands, then also method in action will no longer reach us so far, and so much of it as, uh, as is to be considered indispensable will then at least be formed from theory itself and not take place out of mere imitation. However preeminently a great commander does things, there is always something subjective in the way he does them, and if he has a certain manner, a large share of his individuality is contained in it which does not always accord with the individuality of the person who copies his manner. At the same time, it would be neither possible nor right to banish subjective methodicism or manner completely from the conduct of war. It is rather to be regarded as a manifestation of that influence which the general character of a war has upon its separate events, and to which satisfaction can only be done in that way if theory 
is not able to foresee this general character and include it in its considerations. What is more natural than the war of the French Revolution had its own way of doing things, and what theory could ever have in included that peculiar method? The evil is only that such a man originating a special case easily outlive itself, because continuous whilst circumstances imperceptibly change. That is what theory should prevent by lucid and irrational criticism. When in the year 1806 the Prussian generals Prince Louis uh, at uh, Saalfeld, uh, Tauenzin on the Dornberg near Jena, Gravert before and uh, Ruchel behind Kapellendorf, all threw themselves into the open jaws of destruction in the oblique order of Frederick the Great and managed to ruin Hohenholle's army in a way that no army was ever ruined, even on the field of battle, and this was done through manner which had outlived its day, together with the most downright stupidity to which Methodicism ever led. So, today we concluded the fourth chapter that, as you understand here, is uh, reflecting, uh, finally, on the um, practical utility, on e also on the positive character of doctrine as a method, right? So, this set of uh, laws, principles, rules, and um, regulations and smaller methods, let's say, that are designed to guide methodically the army, right, the commanders um, in you know in, in the war, uh, in the waging of war. So this is naturally very important because we have spent basically the world from Krieger here observing how this mm, positive character of you know approach to war is fundamentally you know. Uh, a failure at, at the end of the day. We have observed how you can't objectively solve the um, enormously complicated system of war. There is no rule that is always valid. There is no behavior that will grant you victory, right? Yet, von Clausewitz says, okay, yes, this is all true, and we have seen why it is true, right? And we can't um, do anything about it in terms of you know denying it, let's say. But, however, th there is a certain behavior, a certain set of notions that is built over time, right, that contains kind of more general um, intuitions, like there are mostly the principles that are kind of more or less valid throughout all history, and that if followed, if kept in mind, can help commanders at least, you know, uh, obtaining a small part of that experience that effectively is the only element that can positively help in the conduct of war, so that there is no, once again, no mm, insurance of uh, assurance of, of victory by you know any stretch of the imagination, but at least there is something that get closer to it that can help uh, after all. Now, here von Clausewitz is not talking about what you know doctrine was formed like historically speaking. He's simply saying that there is, right, doctrines vary over time, we use different doctrines in different historical periods, the way war is fought, the means in which it's fought are different, so it does require different doctrines, and um, and the doctrine itself has this hierarchical structure for which there is a general notion that is generally valid, in fact, for, for all of warfare, then, you know, there are smaller elements that go up to the most trivial things as field services and stuff like that. Naturally, um, the um, paradoxically, the most mm, positive ones in the sense that if you, you know, inoculate them, as von Clausewitz says, in in the troop, um, in the troops, they they will perform it in you know, in a in a functional way, right? But the the more you rise up to the ranks, in spite of having a more general um, <coughs> principle in front of you most of the times. At the same time, it beca becomes more difficult to take action, right? Um, and also, conversely, what what those you know dispositions at at the lower uh, levels of the hierarchy of the ranks, yeah, will work well, but they're you know all the more far from being decisive, effectively, in the way war I is waged, right? So doctrine works as a as a great fluidifier that helps the army work and taking uh, deci I mean the, the military, you know, the commanders taking decisions um, and waging war the way they, they must. So von Clausewitz says 
after you know we have seen effectively how these um, this hierarchy uh, of prints of yeah of, of, of ideas of set of this theory effect of the art of war works when it's taught doctrinally uh, in a methodical way um, and it has a positive effect and von Clausewitz writes method will therefore be the more generally used become the more indispensable the farther down the scale of rank the position of the active agent and on the other hand its use will diminish upwards until in the highest position it quite disappears hmm? so this is very important because it's just we said uh, what we said now uh, but von Clausewitz here stresses the fact that at the top of the chain of command this method basically <laughs> is of no use I mean literally I mean you get at a level of responsibility in which the, the decisions you're taking are based on such uh, a, an immense amount of information that method cannot help while you know how a uh, soldier has to, to pull a cart right it's something uh, and at which time and you know, going where it's something you can instead quite easily applicate right and von Clausewitz in the middle also says for this reason it is more in its place in tactics than in strategy and this is definitely true and as we often said tactics is dramatically easier to understand the strategy and uh, in a certain sense tactics is a more positively teachable uh, theory in itself always given that even in tactics you you're not fully um, going to know what the hell will happen in the first place it's just that the dispositions that you can give are more intuitively evident right and correctly so while in strategy uh, you may really miss a lot uh, of the whole picture simply on you know not realizing something because it, it's hidden it, it's it's uh, multi-layered it's really very very complex then von Clausewitz right, writes, a war in its highest aspects consists not of an infinite number of little events, the diversities in which but compensate each other, and which therefore by a better or worse method are better or worse governed, but of separate great decisive events which must be dealt with separately. Right. This is very very important because um, he's saying okay you can have this doctrine right but at the same time you uh, y it's not something that is gonna really uh, make you distinguish wh whatever thing is is happening in the first place you can't solve the dramatically complicated problem of of, of war of a fight by saying okay I have this doctrine I can applicate this this method the, the set of notions and to the situation and I, I will make it right um, also war in this regard does not have a uniform uh, substance right uh, war is very complicated also because besides we can't effectively calculate it uh, mathematically in, in, as a system but it, it, however we can spot that there are certain um, even though we can't maybe outline them completely and you know drawing their boundaries and, and their interactions there are s some of kind of more important elements in it right um, this great decisive events that we in fact in fact theory theory the art of war concentrates more generally and in fact that that's what principles are normally about right and that however they you know uh, must be applicated assessing what 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 reality is which is really another matter right and therefore this big you know problems that happen in war can't be solved just by a, a uniform formula they have to be solved one by one uh, given the uh, the relative importance that and uh, absolute in it eventually even if you can't draw it observe it precisely they they actually have and in fact here von Clausewitz makes this beautiful me uh, metaphor he says it is not like a field of stalks which without any regard to the particular form of each stalk will be moved better uh, moved moved better worse according as the mowing instrument is good or bad but rather as a group of large trees to which the axe must be laid with judgment according to the particular form and inclination of each separate trunk Right, this is a very good example because it's exactly the point. When you're mowing a uh, <coughs> great field, you're you're just passing the I don't know what's the the name. 
in um, in English, but I mean the let me check the sickle, yeah, and and that will um, you know which you can see as this standard instrument that you know cuts down everything without making you thinking too much of how you have to employ it. So also because you're effectively dealing with all um, more or less similar um, ears, basically. Um, but it, it, it's like when you go in the forest and you have to start chopping down large trees, right? And you have to do it for some reason, by the way, that you are there. And you have to make important choices. And these important choices commit you eventually to chop down that specific tree, for example. And, and with all the consequences that derive from that, so that this, this is very fitting as a metaphor because it makes you realize the, uh, the problems of assessment that you have to make at the beginning of war. And also, once you have, um, uh, you know, uh, and judged effectively what, what, what's best to, to be done and, and act upon it, you, you are thoroughly c committed to a, you know, a difficult task after all that will make you probably think out, uh, you know, um, a second time about your uh, your choice when when it's definitely too late to 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 change it but um that you know the more you go on probably and the more you, the closer you get to the end it kind of will make you mm, understand also the importance of remaining on a certain track this is something from close uh, here doesn't say it but he insists on he says you know yeah, doubt is important. Doubt is important, but you know there, there is a limit to that, and especially when when you have taken one decision, and you have committed your force in that direction. Well, at that point, let's assume you you're wrong. Okay, you you may be defeated, but even if let's assume the enemy is wrong as well, and things are going uh, uh, in, in a certain direction, the, the best at that point is keeping on that track and and doing your best. And, and not thinking too much, you know, with, with afterthoughts and so on, because that could demoralize you at the point. Maybe you you still don't know whether you have done the, the right choice or not, but still, you know, be, and you maybe lose the opportunity to continue, and maybe you will misassess that uh, afterwards, thinking that I don't know, convincing yourself that it was um, the right thing to do to give up, and instead it wasn't right, and that's that's fundamentally bad. So all the Opinions that I mean, all what von Clausewitz is saying here is to you know to be concrete about what's the ultimate goal that you want to reach and how you want to reach it, right? Um, and also to remain consistent most of the times so with your assessment, because in war, like in many other um, situations in life, you are largely res responsible, being fundamentally responsible for your own actions, for your own plans and, and goals and how we achieve them. So um, you can start thinking of all the various things that can go wrong, of whose fault it is when something happened, but you know, still the most important thing is you to go on. It's for you to go on and to do it in a way you you know you can gain from it. So this is really a, a deep thorough thinking that also makes you understand that um, you know who sees everything uh, as a flat uh, field where you know there is really a, a few essentials that you can easily handle in your mind and uh, that's it well that that's quite simplistic your reality that eventually will make you crash against uh, major problems that you were not prepared to deal with and normally we are not right but um, we we can essentially prepare for them in a way that's still better than nothing and that sometimes even more than sometimes can can help us really to to get through that always given that th in that that process is going to be largely determined on how you persist along the way rather than on the preparation this is what von Clausewitz is saying the, the doctrine in itself once again cannot even for the, the, I will see it better later like they can't foretell naturally the outcome of what is going going on and you can't pretend to simply Applicate the set of notions as a sort of fundamental wisdom that will make you win a, at all times, right? There is always the moment in which, uh, most of the times, actually throughout all the way, you you are called to make constant choices, right? Because the situation uh, transforms uh, at every moment. You always have to cope with new challenges that the doctrine itself 
is is not contemplating because th they're so variable that it, it, it's useless to insert in a doctrine for the sake of a you know of a positive um, use of the same. Then von Clausewitz goes on and, and says, um, "How I up in military activity, the admissibility of method in action reaches naturally." The term, it's, uh, the, the term is itself not according to actual rank, but according to things. And it affects the highest positions in a less degree, only because these positions have the most comprehensive subjects of activity. So, as we have said before, um, essentially, the, the importance of method is um, less uh, in the positions of higher responsibility, right? We, whoever is to mm, determine, you know, uh, you know, to take decisions, to modify, to guide a system that is more complicated, has less um, evidence on which to base in order to to act upon it. it it's simple as that, as a concept, right? And then von Clausewitz goes on. It says a constant order of battle, a constant formation of advance guards and outposts are methods by which a general ties not only his subordinates' hands but also his own in certain cases. Mm. Uh, this is true, right? The doctrine gives you tendentially this fake security of relying on, you know, uh, a positive uh, evidence of what needs to be done. Right, th this is a, a, an instinctive, a natural tendency of humans to say, okay, yeah, uh, that that we are lazy thinkers, really, for real. We try to dump everything down, right? In in the whole complexity of the world in which we live, we objectively understand very few of it. But especially, we are not tendentially pushed to know more of it, right? We have an inner tension that pushes towards it, but the, the attrition that it follows is usually um, greater and therefore we tend, you know, if we, we didn't have a sti f external stimulations, we would f fundamentally regress, right, and die out. So, naturally, we are structured in a way that we manage to balance this, but the, especially from a mental point of view, the, the idea that, you know, if you can uh, effectively have a you know, positive take on reality. Uh, it's not optimism. It's 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 really this idea. After all, how complicated would it be, right? In in our mind, what we have to do in the future seems generally, uh, you know, not not necessarily simpler. But we we don't fully expect. We we can't have m means to fully predict the complexity of it. We can. Um, predict maybe that something is um, is going to be bad and difficult. In fact, we tend to to stay away from it because we we're lazy thinkers in that regard too. But also we tend to say, okay, well, this set of notions will, generally speaking, work. And this is the great problem I think we have um, as a society when we think of war. That it seems like everybody uh, has an opinion of it, which is 99 percent of the cases a disinformed opinion. Um, which doesn't work, and it doesn't work because of the fake um, confidence that people pretend to have about these topics, right? And it happens all the time. If you're interested in warfare and you have been on on the internet for a while, you you know what <laughs> what people are capable of. Tendentially, like to 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 give the most improbable interpretations of history, of politics, of reality, just to make themselves feel you know better about it being you know, aware, being, uh, you know, also partly in charge, right? So there, there is this sense of command that partly stems out a bit of craziness. And in fact, that's what von Clausewitz says, you know, that he attributes in, in, in the Trinity uh, a bit of, mm, you know, healthy, maybe slash unhealthy taste for gambling to the military, right? And von Clausewitz sees, rightfully so, the military as gamb gamblers that are attracted by the game in itself. They know they can lose, right? It, it's always there. They can be killed. That something can go wrong. But that's what what fits, right? They, they, there is this part of of, man, of mankind that is attracted by by risk in a certain sense, um, exactly because we tend to uh, instinctively underestimate the um, you know the, the potential of that risk. 
um, but these are you know anthropological anthropological considerations we we don't need now to to expand on um, but here the example is, is clear, right? Uh, von Clausewitz is, has just made the example of, um, for example, of a constant formation, right? Um, that can that now will develop uh, in uh, also with the historical examples, like saying, you know, that there there is a habit, generally speaking, to follow what also others have done, right? This re reliance on definitely on what who seems to be more authoritative that seems to be a have a greater understanding that's also biological we are structured like that we tend to follow the, the leader right because we assume that he uh, knows something we don't and that we tend to project you know greater you know great hopes on him as a matter of fact once we only when we reach um, the same level of the leader we understand what this is about and we start thinking that maybe there is a better way to do it, but the rest of the people, the majority of the people, financially doesn't do it. They simply okay, say, "Okay, we have to follow that," um, and and that's life saving most of the times. So, I mean, historically speaking, so I mean, historically, you know, prehistory, it was like that, right? We we lived in societies where uh, you know it was it was needed to to uh, keep a closed eye if you want if you wanted to su survive to, to blindly accept fundamentally to, to take a leap forward uh, following the, uh, the chief and uh, you know saving your life or you know dying in the attempt and we made it true um, but this happens naturally uh, dangerously in certain situations where certain habits are the product of uh, you know systems that are m somewhat more artificial like von Clausewitz now as as you have already seen makes examples from the 18th from the 19th century that they also knew pretty well since he was involved in them and um and in that case and uh, th there are many other examples historically speaking of certain military traditions and doctrines and mentalities were followed right to disaster because th there was effectively a sclerotization in the um in the fate in the trust in in such uh in such um, method in fact um and von Clausewitz seems to be accepting in this phrase uh the the idea that it, it after all it's not that bad right it's it's natural that we must follow some pattern uh in war so that we will generally rely on a sort of standard uh, set of options, right? Certain formations in the case of tactics, if you look at it, but I mean also in strategy, um, and that are prevented, that are better than nothing. They're sort of standard packed that eventually you can modify along the way, right? And but I, I, the philosophical take on this is very interesting because he highlights the fact that still you're basically limiting yourself in the moment in which you opt for this. Like you don't calculate every time whether you know that uh, standard uh, pack is you know necessarily fitting for this moment. You're just maybe more used to d to do that. You're, you're quick, more quick, uh, you know, more quick at deploying like that. For example, that can be an advantage as well, right? Th do not uh, underestimate even variables like time, because literally this is an enormous system. You you, you can't sort out. And paradoxically, even if maybe that formation at the moment is not the best one, but at least it gives you other advantages that are less intuitive than, however, they are just like deployability, right? For example, certain tactical deployments, historically speaking, were also due partly to the deployability on the field, right? Not just I in an abstract picture in which you just had to meet an enemy o on a given ground without no before, right? Um, and these were things that made a difference, historically speaking, uh, for which also doctrines generally vary, because they are, ex as you know, part of army, you know, adopted by armed forces. They still derive essentially from a uh, political mandate, a political and social context that um, influences how you also fight on the field, right? And um, w that will be clearer with the examples that were. We'll see later historical examples. Um, uh, 
there is an, a further consequence of this doctrinal approach that is um, how many of your uh, subordinates will imitate you, right? Th this is important because it, it makes you understand also how commanders have a, a, a deeper responsibility by themselves. They, they, they are the ones who actually know what they are doing better than their subordinates most of the times. Um, and therefore, they, they probably can't see this, how their subordinates also get tricked by certain, uh, you know, by, by their own confidence towards you, while you know your shortages, your failures, right? Uh, it's a bit like an information. You give, you know, the masses a, a new to, to feed them, and they will react in a certain way, right? Maybe there is so much else to know they will never know about, but at least maybe they're content with that. And there, there, there are pros and cons to this, too. Um, then von Clausewitz goes on and, and says, uh, certainly they may have um, uh, been, uh, so he is talking about the subordinates, they may have been uh, devised by himself, the, the commander, the general, and may be applied by him according to circumstances, but they may also be a subject of theory um, in so far um, as they are based on the general properties of troops and weapons. Oh, excuse me, we were talking about the, the dispositions here, no, not on the troops. So, um, yeah, so here he, he's introducing the concept that uh, obviously um, even through doctrine as a method, in, in reality, nobody will effectively follow that doctrine, right? As we often say, every army, every tactic, every strategy, but also every individual is different. So historically, there have never been two identical um, armies or soldiers, as there have never been uh, standard tactics that were, you know, absolutely valid to defeat the enemy every time. There is there is an, a br but we will have to talk about this when especially we will discuss, I don't know, uh, this topic always comes to my mind, uh, the, you know, the Hundred Years' War, English Longbow, French Cavalry, you know, the, the still many people are convinced, for example, that there was a standard tactic, the English always won because they, they had that, you know, and the, the French a bunch of idiots who went themselves killing themselves all the time, uh, without changing their doctrine because they were just um, not mentally flexible. This concept doesn't take into consideration anything can be considered as a military, or as a realistic military assessment, right? You, you can't um, think I in such a primitively mechanistic um, and technologistic way, um, assuming that m things like, I don't know, fog of war, moral forces have not uh, a play into this. this. This obsession that, I don't know if it's people, you know, because they get it from, from video games or through a certain side of, uh, you know, certain aspect of, uh, of historical uh, reenactment, they, they stress just this individual and m mechanical read weapons side of, of history, of warfare, of combat, and, and, and all that enormous at this point, chunk of popular culture essentially revolves around that, right? And this this is really a primitive thinking, a particularly dangerous and seemingly you know almost irremovable one, right? This fate, this absurd fate in I don't know which weapon you use or which tactic you use um, in a, in an abstract situation to determine which one is better and which one is worse in, in absolute terms, right? You you know I would. You know, I would throw them th the foam Krieger in, in, into their teeth, right? <laughs> that there is no way you can reason like that when you study warfare. Um, in 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 reality, uh, the, the the beautiful thing about that, sadly, I mean, sadly and beautifully at the same time, because there is hope afterwards, is that most of the, uh, these people have never studied the same combat they're they're actually trying to sort out in that way through the actual historical sources, because whoever has uh, um, an historical preparation in that regard and knows what, what the interpretation of those sources is and not reading, you know, cherry picking a few phrases from a manual to prove whether a weapon was used or not because that's where mostly, you know, that chunk of popular culture stops to but talking about 
a real comprehensive study on all the available sources on a given comet. It can take years, literally, right? Uh, who does that, honestly? Well, only that could show them how how wrong that attitude is. And indeed, the sad thing instead about this is that there doesn't seem to be there doesn't seem to be uh, at that level any uh, you know s structural systemic um, factor of improvement. Like it's as if the people were repeating always the same things, the same questions. Right? What's the better way can to fit this standard type of army? This kind of deployment, this kind of guys in place and here and there, armed with this specific weapon, right? Um, this is a serious problem. I don't know. I'll have to address it uh, at one point. Um, I promised you once I would make a video on it, and we should start uh, entering this more uh, theoretical sign of, of warfare, right? Uh, because there is a serious lack of strategic education in this regard. It, it's not merely. Um, you know, reading a bunch of history books and pretending you're 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 acquainted to the, to these problems. This requires really a lot of time of and commitment that can derive from from different backgrounds, right? Uh, as you know, I never t I never tell you like you have to be an historian to 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 do so. But at least you should take in consideration that there is a proper way of doing that, and that uh, a sheet of paper. Uh, title doesn't make a difference like that. Everybody can do it, but still, it, it requires an enormous amount of time and resources, which naturally, and that's the explanation why these things go on all the time. Most people cannot af cannot afford, in general, I mean, the, in the economy of their lives, right? Because they have other things to do. Because, in fact, they don't. Chiefly, I think it's a matter of interest, right? At the end of the day, but these concepts must be stressed. There must be someone who's, who says these things out and loud because we may really suffer all. like you may think well this is maybe you know the one of the, our, the first problems we have yeah but the, the the mindset that 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 nurtures them is in, in many ways improvable through even the, the dispelling of, of such uh, thinking uh, which is not to be underestimated and believe me military history is uh, military history does change your life that it does change the way you think and not in the way other subjects do because it has a specifically um it has a specific mm, mm, you know mm, mm, i would say method even in here but it's it's more than that it's really a, a true all the things you have to pass through in order to to get to a point uh, in there but we'll discuss in another occasion um and um, and then from Clausewitz go going on, uh, writes, on the other hand, any method by which definite plans for wars or campaigns are to be given out already made, as if from a machine, are absolutely worthless. Thanks from Clausewitz. <laughs> That's exactly was what I was trying to actually explain through you, because you taught me partly this. So, uh, greatly this, I would say better. That's exactly the point. If you think that you know there is a definite plan for a war or a campaign, as if you know you said, okay, we do this, it will, okay, well, it will never work. Like it, there, it's not that a matter of probability of chance. Like it will never work because as as long as as immediately as you started that uh, you start that it, it you will be obliged to take another path. Right, and that gives you the, the dimension of how complicated and and continuously demanding this thing is. Right, you can't set the thing at the beginning and thinking you will simply go along it, and then it's just a matter of endurance uh, of uh, you know uh, strength of something like that. No, you will have to choose different things. You have to solve an enormous amount of problem all the step of the way. And it doesn't sound not nearly as hellish as, as it really is, right? Um, and then for close, it goes on and, and writes, as long as there exists no theory which can be sustained, that is, no enlightened treatise on the conduct of war, method in action cannot but encroach beyond its proper limits in high places. 
for men employed in these spheres of activity have not always the opportunity of educating themselves through study and through contact with the higher interests. Okay, so here maybe it's better explained later, but von Clausewitz is highlighting, as far as I understand, that um, what we what he stressed himself uh, in many occasions is that the, the, the military man, um, in order to be effective, doesn't necessarily have to be educated, right? Um, it, first of all, this is not the most important point of the question, right? Um, because direct military experience is a much better teacher than what military history can be. Paradoxically, however, that's still military history because if you go to war and you're still you're essentially living that that story and eventually you're going to research on it afterwards in your memories and in your experience. So it all stems from that, right? If you really have to, to sum up everything, you there is no other way according to von Clausewitz than um, direct, exp I mean, experience of war, you know, possibly direct one um, to understand and to build up a, a doctrine and, and employing it eventually as a method, right? Um, and in he goes on and says, in the impractical, impracti uh, blah, excuse me, in the impracticable and inconsistent disquisitions of theorists and critics, they cannot find their way. Their sound common sense rejects them and as they bring with them no knowledge but what that's derived from experience, therefore in those cases which admit of and require a free individual treatment, they readily make use of the means which experience gives them, that is, uh, uh, an imitation of the particular methods practiced by great generals by which a method of action then arises of itself. So this is important because um, he's telling us that, okay, um, you know, generals are, uh, I mean, com military commanders are used to be practical and concrete people, right? Because experience taught them so. Um, and therefore, they will simply reject everything that is, is not made of that substance, right? Especially when th they really have to take action, right? Uh, that's why we, what we train the, mil the military for. Right, that's how the military works. It's it's a matter of think about discipline, right? If you anybody who has been in the military has been minimal military experience has received orders and been um, obliged to, to to perform and knows what that gives you as an individual, right? It, it, it's terribly empowering. I mean, I I know certain people maybe can't take it, but I can tell you from from direct experience that it makes you feel as if um, at that point you 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 could really be a part of the system that that is a hell of a fluid one because you feel ready to do a lot of more than you could ever think you, you could perform when you are pressed in the in the right way in towards the right direction right and you 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 feel em empowered by the responsibility that is, is entrusted to you with that same order from the mentor um, so that however has a sort of collateral effect that that once again is not necessarily wrong it's not necessarily bad right it's actually useful but it can lead in certain cases especially because of people who are at the top so yeah you in a certain way you surrender part of your um individuality definitely and th that's also what the military aims at because that's what you need to go there out killing people because otherwise believe me you can't do that and, and yet we must do it because in many cases we're obliged to um but th the point is you tend in in this practical mindset to i mean i don't know because eventually i didn't uh, as you know i'm not a military man um i didn't follow that path eventually but um you probably also developed a certain and you can see it easily from from military history a certain um trust and confidence and faith even in your in your in your commanders like just think about caesar's uh veterans of the gallic wars what they would have done for caesar we know that they adored him right and so and because that was a hell of a commander and had all of them to, to achieve the, the unthinkable. Um, so that wakes, but there is, once again, this collateral effect that, albeit good for discipline at that point, and morale, um, could make you essentially 
uh, forget in part the um, you know that 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 amount of uh, autonomy that is required actually to every military man. This is very stressed by von Clausewitz. It was also in fact at the base of the Prussian military doctrine um, that allowed you know the, the victory in 1870. Um, and also partly, you know, in the German doctrine, World War the First, World War the Second. I mean, this uh, autonomy that officers must have, generally speaking, you can't simply, in fact, take uh, that doctrine and you know follow it and wait formally everything, every message, every you know, you you must take action at one point by yourself. So. A problem here is that also you tend to imitate your general in the uh, in that um, in that situation as well. I mean, if a general is particularly famous for performing one tactics, and now von Clausewitz will make some examples. Well, theory in practice, I mean, theory is in the sense that uh, history shows us that the the subordinates uh, will tend to imitate that uh, that disposition, even though maybe that's not the best one to imitate. And and that can be crippling. Now, von Clausewitz writes: If we see Frederick the Great's generals, right, always making their appearance in the so-called oblique order of battle, uh, the generals of the French Revolution always using turning movements with a long, extended line of battle, and Bonaparte's lieutenants rushing to the attack with the bloody energy of concentrated masses, then we recognize in the recurrence of the mode of proceeding evenly an adopted method and see therefore that matter of action can reach up to regions bordering on the highest right so he's actually complimenting here those generals in those specific times because objectively both i mean uh, i mean all of these examples i mean uh, uh, frederick's the great army the french revolutionary armies uh, and napoleon's armies were you know functioning pretty damn well for for the for the time standards they they performed um in a way that um that gave results i'm thinking especially about the french revolutionary forces that were in which for example common citizens gave the proof of being actually pretty damn good and you know uh, motivated troops um aside from the most obvious examples of individuals like napoleon and frederick the great uh, but the point here is that we're talking about generals that tended to follow the example of, of the main leaders. So replicating certain tactical methods that did work pretty well. And that von Clausewitz says, you know, they basically w w made a doctrine in those cases reaching almost a level of, perf of um, you know, of perfection what had needed to be done, right? Obviously, you know. In, a, in an approximated way of perfect imitation of those great generals so that it's as if uh, the, they had been, you know, that these armies had been manned after all by only by one person, one mind, right? Because these tactical methods, by the way, were effectively functioning well. Um, so that's a case in which doctrine has a such um, an evidently successful outcome, right? It's not always like that, though. You can't take doctrine, once again, in itself as the key for obtaining those success, right? Because things change eventually, and they did change. Von Clausewitz writes, should an improved theory facilitate the study of the conduct of war, form the mind and judgment of men who are rising to the highest commands, uh, then also method in action will no longer reach so far and so much of it has uh, is to be considered indispensable will then at least be formed from theory itself and not take place out of mere imitation. Right? So from Clausewitz points out, yeah, okay, there is a doctrine which is generally something functional, right? But at the same time, uh, there is a, a field, if you want, of uh, you know, in which you can act with, and you, which you, in which you should, right, act if you want to win. If outside of that same doctrine, 
that at that point you must basically sort out by yourself you have to discover by yourself right then von Clausewitz writes however preeminently a great commander does things um, there is always something subjective in the way he does them right so it's normal after all that every especially those commanders that give the example that form the doctrine in, in, in a way like Frederick the Great with the oblique order or Napoleon with his concentrated you know bombardments and then mass charges uh, in the enemy ranks uh, eventually uh, differs from from time to time and this is kind of obvious in the sense that once again it, it's not possible to adopt always the same idea because r reality simply changes every time yet it's important to stress because humans do tend that ah that's the model that wins right and, and we just have to follow it especially those who are in the lower ranks tendentially are like that right and uh, and then von Clausewitz goes on and says and if he has the the great commander a certain manner a large share of his individuality is contained in it which does not always accord with the individuality of the person who copies his manner right at the same time it would neither be possible nor right to banish subjective methodicism or manner completely from the conduct of war. It is rather to be regarded as a manifestation of that influence which the general character of war has upon its separate events and to which satisfaction can only be done in that way if theory is not able to foresee this general character and include it in, uh, it in its considerations. So, obviously, not only things are always going to differ generals are always going to behave differently for some reason but also we can't pretend the doctrine as a method is all you need um, in order to to wage war right uh, we can't banish what is outside of doctrine as n unimportant or not part of this greater theory that we do need for the conduct of war in itself I mean it, it's a if you want, uh, in the luckiest of um, of situations, it's it's a complementary element that you always need to uh, to consider, right? Forcefully at every step. Um, and von Clausewitz then writes, "What is more natural than that the war of the French Revolution had its own way of doing things, and what theory could ever have included that peculiar method, right?" Here, it's, it's an important idea because it, it also shows you that these doctrines are specific of a given context that is not strictly military. You can't understand the tactics of the French Revolution if you don't study French politics or society at that time. Who were the people who went to fight there? How trained they were? What they were motivated by? Right? Um, so, and, and that varies at, at all times. So it, it's important because it, it gives you context and perspective. It makes you realize that um, there is no symmetry in war, as we have always stated. There is nothing like a symmetrical warfare in reality, as always. You can approximate on that, saying, okay, well, th there was kind of more similar fighting in certain ways, okay, but war, by definition, is asymmetrical. That is not von Clausewitz or saying that, it, but it, it's the second principle of thermodynamics, right? It, 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 it's impossible to do otherwise. Um, then von Clausewitz writes, this is what theory should prevent by lucid and rational criticism. So that is, if you want, the probably this, this realization, I mean, the, the single most important element for the same application of doctrine as a method because doctrine doesn't mean that you have to shut your brain and simply applicate that doctrine is just a help let's remember that all this these last 
chapters are about the theory of, of, of the art of war, right? And they are that is just what you have to have next to you while you fight, but you don't have to stay reading it all the time. Not even for the major parts, it's just one thing you have to go back to every once in a while to clarify your mind in order to take action based on your mind and, and of the act, uh, of the current situation that is widely different and is not written in that manual. And von Clausewitz makes an example that is very dear to him because it's a nutshell the the history of um, of Prussia's um, of Prussian destruction at the hand of Napoleon in 1806 that brought to uh, uh, you know to the co the, the conquest of Prussia from the side of the French. It von Clausewitz eventually you know gave up, fled to Russia, it went to f finding the French from there. I mean, it, it, he believed to the, the annihilation of his country on the battlefield and and at home in that regard. And in fact, he uh, writes um, this. Um, yeah, uh, excuse me. When in the year 1806, the Prussian generals, Prince Louis at Saalfeld, uh, Tauenzin on the Dogenberg near Jena, Grabert before uh, Rüchel behind uh, Kapellendorf, all threw themselves into the open jaws of destruction in the oblique order of Frederick the Great and managed to ru ruin Hohenhohle's army in a way that no army was ever ruined. Right? He is very, very uh, tranchant in this uh, uh, statement. Even on the field of battle, and all this, all this was done through manner which had outlived its day, together with the most downright stupidity to which methodicism ever led. So this is a powerful uh, reminder uh, to us, but you know you, you couldn't understand for a 19th century Prussian what this meant. Um, that yeah, you can use doctrine as a method but not pretending that doctrine is even remotely close to make you win wars by simply, you know, applicating it to to the latter and, with, and without losing. So what it says is that, you know, Prussian generals in the early 19th uh, century were still thinking in the in the doctrine of the uh, of the Seven Years' War and they went there uh, against the Napoleonic army and they got annihilated right which is what happened effectively and why because everybody was still thinking to follow Frederick the Great's tactic as if that could be valid at every time right in that moment uh, and 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 so we've seen how it's gone so that is the uh, this is just an historical example but you understand that from, from also from a just a theoretical point of view there can't be uh, simply a, a formula they, y y that that you can use to describe reality and to interfere with it uh, to obtain certain results um, as if you know there was no no other problem to worry about and this is what life constantly puts us in front of in the sense that uh, what are we thinking I mean when we um, we're thinking of the future, things we have to do, we don't think we we have the answer for everything. We stress actually the fact that we we don't know how things can go, and it is true. We don't know. There is no way to know, and that's why we generally rely on certain on something that we must use to even start, right? But eventually, most of the of the work is going to be done along the way right and we don't know how it's gonna go anyway uh, I know it, it sounds uh, somewhat uh, you know depressing especially in these times but I, I think it's it's it, that's the point I mean you can't uh, you, you should be happy paradoxically that we are aware that we have a free will, that we, that we are able to to realize this limit, because it it's true that limit that we can do a lot, 
right and um and that's what what you have to to rely day after day it's it's, it's this realization of not knowing that we can know the most right we can achieve th the better results so uh, i think uh, this was the end of course of of uh, the fourth chapter we'll pass the next one is the criticism um, so we stop it here and for now just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise do a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye